Us. Us. Mitch. How good are you? to see you again for the third time today. Yep. We uh, actually we train together a couple of times before the live stream every Wednesday. So um, uh, you know, it's good to catch up. Uh, today we're going to look at some takedown options for the stand-up fighter. I think that's um, we work on the five ranges, the kick range, punch range, the headbutt elbow range. Sometimes people call that the uh, the um, trapping range. Range four, the stand-up grapple, and range five is the ground range. And to get from range one in is quite – it takes a little bit of homework. Would you agree? Absolutely. Um, so I always say that you have five ranges, and each range trumps the range – before it so if you're fighting a good kicker clearly you move inside the kick range and work your punches if they're a good puncher even the best boxers will move into the trapping range and tie up the arms to prevent the boxer from being able to uh, capitalize in his best skills uh, and from the the stand-up uh, trapping range, the head butt elbow range, you move in even closer to get control of their balance and body, and then you take them down to the ground. Well, what we want to look at today is the whole idea of transitioning through that inside uh, and finding ways for the karate fighter to take them down to the ground in a reasonably safe way. Now, the thing is, uh, if you enter into the punching range and the elbow head, the elbow headbutt range in there, it presents there's a lot of danger of impact, and this is one thing that the MMA fighters have in their favour, as opposed to the straight grapplers, and the advantage of the grapplers versus the stand-up fighters. You may remember today that uh, we talked about. Here we go. Whoops. We talked about um, uh, how important it is to understand that the transition is the whole key to everything. You can't go from range one and then dive into range four because you just don't have the body shape. You can't overreach with your hands. The other thing, too, is that certain techniques require you uh, in a grappling situation, you can just go in quite open because there's no danger of the impact. But from a karate perspective, we have to take into account the headbutts, the elbows, even the punches and things like that. So that's why it's really, really uh, important that we, we look at those today. Us, Marco, Daniel, us, might see you on the weekend, Daniel. I'm down in Sydney, everyone. If... Uh, um, I'm doing some training with uh, the Five Doc Dojo, Anthony Zamadia, and uh, uh, the KKA guys, guys there. France, Francis Gravel, us, good to see you. Good morning from Sweden, Frederick. Chrissy. Freddy. And Freddie. Hey, Freddie. Chrissy's my nephew. Freddy's, Freddy's my little uh, nephew's son. Dave, us. Good on you. Thanks for coming. Or Sensei Mike, Daniel, 100%. Look forward to seeing you. Paul from Germany, good to see you. Okay, so let's briefly look at this whole notion of getting inside. It's not easy, but we have to try and reduce our options down. So here we are. We're in this situation. We have to get inside. Salsa used to call it superior airspace or dominating with air superiority using an air force term what did he mean by that he meant we have to control this inside space if for karate perspective i like to get on the outside because i can be here with my dominant head angle but i'm and he is still in my dead zone but he is his dead zone is heading to a different direction. Right here, it's 50-50. I move at an angle. Now I still have him a dominant in my dominant uh, head angle, but his is off. 
So this is where the concept of micro adjustments becomes very, very important. The whole idea of you have your opponent in your sight and even a small change in angle can be deceptive. And I think because he's still within my peripheral vision that I'm still 50-50. But the reality is my body is still in that angle. My dead zone is in that angle but he still has me with his dominant head. So he has a big advantage. So when you're sparring, the fact, the reality is, if he makes a small adjustment, I have to make that adjustment as well. And I have to keep moving. And I can't be lazy about that. And that becomes even more important when I want to come in and control the inside space, maintain air superiority. Okay, there's a couple of things which we need to understand for the inside. The most important thing is a collar tie here is dominated by the elbow. Why? I need a heavy elbow. If there's no elbow control, the headbutt just and the punch just comes in. I have no control over his posture with a light elbow. The hand connected to the head is secondary to the, the, the weight and heaviness of the elbow. The light elbow, he can just simply headbutt me back. With a heavy elbow, now he can't do that, and I can redirect. And if he tries to punch me with that hand, I block and switch sides, and now I'm going into this dirty boxing sort of thing. Okay? Dirty boxing is just good karate. <laughs> or there like that. Heavy elbow, pushing your way there, bang, bang. If he tries to hit me with that arm, I push away there, and I can switch there. Now... This is a good game. We covered that in a previous video, as you may remember. But now what we're going to do is we're going to use this to now take my opponent to the ground. I want to look at this idea of strong elbow, break posture, let it go, and drive with a high head. Okay? Is this hand dangerous? You better believe it. Okay, so I'm, I'm keep this hand around. So when he throws that punch, boom, I capture it. And look at this hand now. I can control right there. So now when he tries to throw that punch, it's not as uh, dangerous. But now the next danger is the eye gouge with the other hand. That's a reality too, which has happened to me before. So what I'm going to do is take that and then drive into the takedown where you change the angle. Remember... Forgetting about all the headbutts, elbows, bites, and so on. If I drive my opponent backwards, my opponent always has the ability to keep maintaining strength. And eventually you hit a wall or a post, and that will give him, give him even more strength to fight and he can get under hooks. And so I don't want to drive straight back. I want to break inside, get control inside, dominant space, come in and then turn the angle like that. And that's how you get your partner down. But I want to show you a really, really interesting way to take your partner down that was taught to me by my friend Eric Paulson. What it is is this idea of getting control of the wrist and dragging the wrist to the ground. So if we move back here a little bit, I'll just change this angle. So the whole idea is, I'm here, boom, I get inside. I need to control. This hand becomes less uh, of a danger if I have the elbow in position. No elbow, he's just going to punch me in the liver and all that sort of stuff. Strong elbow, now he punches me in the liver, he can't get the extension he needs. In the meantime, I can do things with this. Okay? I want to get control of this hand and then... I'm going to slide both hands down and I squeeze the wrist. Now from there, I still have dominant head. So I still have him in my dead zone. But by having changed the angle, I, his dead zone is over there now. So I pull down and if I pull straight down, you see there's nothing here. So what I'm doing is creating an empty space and filling it with his body. So I'm in this situation, break down, just this movement. From that position, 
break, collar tie, heavy elbow, punch, punch. He blocks. He does, I get control of that arm. I drop my head in to replace the hand, and now I have two hands here. Now what I'm going to do is drive that hand straight to the ground. And that's what pulls my opponent down. I can hit knee. I can come cross face here. Or if you want to play the grappling, go to the mat here like this and start to do the dirty business of choking and all that stuff. We have to draw a line somewhere for our training. If you want to go to close quarter combat and work on concepts of real fighting, then you have to take into account the biting, the gouging, the, uh, the improvised weapons, which could be a pen or a, for women a, a, a brooch um, needle, things like this. There's a whole bunch of possible, even credit cards are the most dangerous blades in the world. So you have to take that into account. We have to draw a line somewhere. We're not really talking about that right now. What we want to do is look at the possibilities here of an empty hand situation. One, two. One, two, three. Collar tie, heavy elbow. I replace my hand with my head. Two hands come down to here, and I drive his hand down to the mat. Okay, that's a really, really very powerful. Yeah. So what I can do here is if I want his leg, right arm, right leg, if I want to take that leg, I move away from the leg. That pulls the leg forward. So I come in, collar tie, bang, bang. If he blocks there, I'm going to knock it down and take control, replace my hand with the head, and if I want that leg, I'm going to pull the hand, and then I simply work on the low single, which we'll work on today. The low single, I think, is a really valuable go-to takedown for the stand-up fighter simply because it's very high percentage. And if you remember when... Uh, Randy Couture fought James Tony. Yeah. James Tony was one of the best boxers in history. And if you look at James Tony's record, he has one of the best knockout rates. So he was a serious knockout expert. And just so happens I did a couple of sessions with Randy Couture before that fight. I wasn't training for the fight, obviously, but I was just in that environment. And they were having a little bit of a laugh. Their whole idea was... James Tony is saying, this princess has never been hit. I'm going to show him what it's like to be really hit. And their attitude was, well, we agree. He's one of the hardest punches. Why would we even think that we want to be hit by him? So their plan was go low, low single, take him. And what happened was he did, went low, got low single, actually got James Tony's back and got him from the back. But the point was, against a strong puncher or kicker, you don't want to be in the punch kick range here like this. The stronger man wins. So what you're going to do is you're going to come in, and this isn't what Randy did. What Randy did is from a distance here, came in, dropped down low, and took him with the low single push. Okay? Now that low single, here's how it works. And you know, you may know it from Garyu, the Kyokushin Kata Garyu. Uh, Solsai created it where they have this the technique here, and you know in the cardio you come to here and this movement. What that is, is it's a Aiki Jiu-Jitsu technique that's also learned from uh, um, Kotaro. Uh, what was it? Yoshida Sensei. Push the knee 45 back, catch the ankle. Oh, and then like that. And they go straight down. Okay? One of the things we have to be conscious of when we do that, of course, is the knee coming in. So I, I block, I salute, and I block. So when bang, and then that's why I don't push the knee here with my elbow down. I like to push the knee here with my elbow up. So if the knee comes, it blocks the knee. And then from there, you can simply push it down. The other thing you have to be conscious of when you do this is not to try and lift the leg because that allows him to do that. If he has reasonable uh, agility and endurance in his leg, he will knock you out before you get him on the ground. Okay? So you never lift the foot. What you do is you plant the foot on the ground, 
and push the knee back. Once he goes to the ground, then you can lift the foot and dominate in this sort of situation like that. By lifting the foot, the reason we lift the foot is simply, if I don't lift the foot, when I come around, he's gone. He, he hits away and he'll step up safely. But if you look at all those movements that he just did, he needs the foot. So by elevating the leg, particularly if he has jeans or pants on, now when he tries to do all those movements, it's really hard to do, he can't do it. I just and then depends on the degree of severity. If you want, you can just come into this situation and hit. Okay, so that's really important that you recognise that once you take him down, there should not be separation. You need to maintain that. I'm in this position. Bang, bang, come in. Strong collar tie means heavy elbow. Bang, bang. Replace my hand with the head as soon as I get control of this wrist. Slide this hand down to the wrist so I have two hands on one, and I'm going to pull that leg forward. As I pull it forward, I take my hand down and then continue on like that. So I take his hands to his uh, foot. Let me go this side so you see a little better. From here, control the wrist, replace, and look. I come here now. I push the hand down towards his leg. I keep hold of it. If he rips his hand out really strongly, boom, you just take the leg. It's that simple. But if you have the strong grip, it's really hard for him to take the hand out. And then I just simply transition my hands to the leg and take him down. Oops. Once, many years ago, at the Margaret Street Dojo, we were doing this, and you, what you did just reminded me of it. As I took someone down, this foot came up and kicked me in the head. Wow. And they didn't even mean to. It just, it's just what happened. So since then, that's where I started the salute business. What I was doing then, I came down, took it, and I went like that. And I got used to doing that just as a habit, just to make sure that even if they unintentionally do it, you still won't get screwed in. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? So I'm in here, get control of this hand, replace my hand with my head, two hands down, pull, get hands near his ankle and grab his ankle, okay? But what happens, you say, yeah, but he wouldn't leave his ankle there. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. He needs a strong base, so it depends how maneuverable he is. But I go for that leg, he pulls it back, I go for this leg now, and I drive his head into that cement pole. <laughs> Okay, so you, the habit you develop when you're doing the low single is not that I will 100% get this leg. What I like to think is I will 100% miss this leg, so I'm going to go for the second one. So as I go for this leg, I'm already transition, transitioning in. And that's why, interestingly, I think anyway, in uh, Garu Kata, you do these twice, right? You come in and there. This, you lose the front of the first one, you take the second one. Oh, so what I'm doing is I'm here. He fights this, he punches me. Boom. I get control of that hand. Boom. Dominant head down to there. He takes that leg back. I attack that one. But here's a nice little sweet thing as well. You don't want to let go of the hand because maybe he has a knife in the hand. Maybe. I'm not the man to talk to about knife fighting. Go and speak to Nick Hughes. By the way, if you haven't got your copy of Nick's new updated version of How to Be Your Own Bodyguard, uh, you won't see photos of two black belts holding hands in that, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone should get it. I don't care who you are. That is a must-get book. I think everybody should get it. And if you teach karate or if you teach martial arts, you have to get a copy of that book so that you know what you're talking about when it comes to self-protection, okay? Anyway, that's a separate thing. Right now, I don't want to let go of this. I come down to take the leg. He takes the leg back. Oh! The timing of that is really important. Watch. If, if he gets his leg back and plants it strongly, now when I pull this, it's really, really strong. If anything, I'd probably go for this leg instead. 
But watch what happens if I time it so that just as his foot goes back, he still hasn't got any weight on it. You drag suddenly. So I'm here like this. I want that leg. He takes it back, boom, drag it straight away, and you can pull into back control or finish with a karate technique. Or oh, look, I don't want to go there. You can do what you want after that. Oh, but more to the point is there are three options we look at. The first one is I take this leg, hand on the heel, head on the inside, or hand on the heel. Knee on the uh, hand on the inside of the knee, or as I go for that leg, he takes it back and I continue on to the other leg. So I tell myself that even though I'm a, I'm looking for this leg, I tell myself it's 100% guaranteed I don't get it because against a good fighter, that's exactly how it is. I go here, I go for that leg, and I immediately go for the other leg. Okay, so you don't have to think. Don't tell yourself, I'm going to get this leg. He pulls it back. Oh, now what do I do? Because now you've just recreated the same situation. So you go, and then he pulls that one back too late. What I need to do is do it without thought. So I come here, go for this leg, takes it back immediately, go for that one. Okay? And the third option, which I really love, come in, bang, 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 get control of this hand. I go for this leg, he pulls it back, boom. I pull him straight back down. Notice when I, I do it, I don't pull his hand this way. What I do is I'm dragging it to his foot. He takes that foot back. Boom. I drag it back down to where his foot was. And if you want to, if you want to grapple, you take this knee, drive it in his belly, pull, pull him into the back, and finish with a choke. Push. Yeah. Okay, so there are your three options. Drag the hand down, take the front leg. Drag the hand down, he pulls that back, take the back leg. Drag down, he pulls that back, pull him back down again. Okay, and they're all very, very powerful, very interesting options. The important thing to remember is when I'm in here, I need the heavy elbow to avoid the headbutts. Bang. No heavy elbow, bang. Heavy elbow, control that. I need the heavy elbow to control this inside punch. Boom, there, and I need the heavy elbow to control this punch, and when a punch comes, boom, I switch sides, and then I go there, boom. And that, that's the game you played, which is we, which is what we did in a previous video. Okay, and from there, hand repl head replaces hand, two hands on one, drag down. There you have it. So that's a really good little flow that you can play with to help develop your skills uh, in the takedown. And if you're coming along on uh, on Saturday in Sydney where I'm doing the seminar for the So Kyokushin boys, well then by all means, uh, we'll be working that as well. Good to see everyone. Marco, Chrissy, hi Uncle. Hey, hi Estelle. Estelle. How are you? That's my little niece again. Well, Christian's my nephew. But anyway, us, Marco. I know this may be Superlative question, do you think there is a link between understanding physics and combative sport? I think nothing in combative sport breaks the rules of physics, but not understanding physics means you can't fight. Understanding physics helps. For example, uh, the session we did a couple of weeks ago where we worked on the opposites, law of opposites. Uh, Newton's third law, every action has an opposite equal reaction. Well, that's what we're working. If you push, they pull back in. If you pull them, they push you push them back. That, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so I think understanding physics really helps. Even for example, uh, understanding the mechanics of getting this strong grip here and dragging straight down in short, sharp pulls. That's more not so much well, it is physics, but not so much physics as biomechanics. Yes. Understanding the nature of the body. Yeah, good point. Interesting application of what I understand is Muchimi, yes, the stickiness. Yes, exactly. I Look, I love this. I'm not really super familiar with Muchimi, Sensei Mike, but I am familiar with the importance of contact and stickiness, and I use it all the time. For example, I'll show you what I mean. Just as a sample, as an example, 
Let's look at, let's just come here, Mitch. Oops. I have Mitch's hand. And I'm going to hold on pretty strong. I want Mitch, Mitch to try and pull his hand out. Okay. Now I have Mitch's hand and Mitch's hand. Uh, uh. So now I have two hands on one, but no more stickiness. So now I ask him to pull it out again, boom, and he gets it out. Now what I'm going to do is start to leverage. For me, the definition of leverage is using more and more of my body against less and less of his. Okay? So now I want to increase the amount of stickiness. So now I have this, I have this, and now I put my body against his arm. Now I get him to pull it out. And I let go in the end, it would have been even harder. But now I increase what I consider to be optimal control of the two on one is shoulder pressure on top of his shoulder. So now I have hand, hand, the entirety of his arm touching my body and my shoulder pressure on his shoulder. So I end up here. So now Mitch tries to get his arm out. No hope. And he's, he's not going anywhere. So that's. My understanding of Muchimi, that stickiness, and not only that, the, the Muchimi concept of when he throws the punch at me, boom, this sort of movement. We practiced this today in training, oh, remember? Oh, Where we just there, and he grabs, boom, and I change, boom. And you just play this game of constantly looking for the grips, okay? And it's a really good drill to do. In Sydney, we'll do that as well. But, yeah, good point, Sensei Mike. Um, I think that whole concept of stickiness is really, really vital. If they haven't studied it, their techniques are based on them. Um, yes, I think so. Even if you haven't studied physics, uh, a good technique is just based on good biomechanics and you'll, physics. You'll see that all the time. For example, if you're, if you're doing wrestling, like the wrestling sessions we do, and sometimes you'll practice shooting in for a double leg, as an example, if you put the camera down to my feet, you often see people want to go back and then forward because they want to load up and you just stretch shortening cycle like mechanical energy. Yes. Like our bodies know it intuitively. Yeah. So, so you want to minimize some of those things because they would tell sometimes. But so yeah, absolutely. sound technique and sound biomechanics, biomechanics is in perfect accord with physics. It can't break those rules. Science rules. Uh, even if you don't know the science, but you do know the biomechanics, you're obeying the rules of physics. The, the flip side is if you know physics really well but have never applied it to a physical uh, environment, it doesn't mean that you can make it work well. Um, so I think start with the physical star side and add the study of physics to it so it starts to make more and more sense to you. Oops. Al, hey, Al. How are you? Oops, good to see you. Oh, good on you. Yeah, look, I think Nick Hughes is... Uh, Highly underestimated. Well, he's not really. The ones who know him know him. I think um, I think Nick's book, I'll just type it in, is, I think, really, really important uh, for everybody. And especially if you're a martial artist. See, the problem is, um, I remember interviewing Rico Ciparelli many years ago uh, for a martial arts magazine. Rico, as you know, is my wrestling, my main wrestling teacher. And he said, I said, from the martial artist viewpoint, for quite a long time, we'd look at wrestling and think it was just a sport and it really didn't have application. And then I wrestled a wrestler and everything changed. And he said, yeah, it was funny because the wrestlers would look at the martial artists and think all that was just for show because the wrestlers are – pressure testing everything they have they have with 100% uh, energy and practicality every single time they compete, whereas karate is a little different. So even in Kyokushin where we have that really powerful impact and, and the contact, we still don't punch to the head. So if you want to punch to the head, you've got to put gloves on. Well, that changes the reality once again. You know, you've got a 12-ounce glove on, someone throws a hook, you just cover like that. But the reality is if it's bare fist, you'd still get knocked out etc etc so you can go on and on and on um that's that's that impractical martial arts ver approach versus the practical side and i think as a martial arts teacher we have to be conscious of the danger of that 
we have to be conscious of the danger of teaching something that isn't really pressure tested. And by pressure testing, I don't just mean making it work when you do it 100%. I mean making it work when the other guy is 100% trying to do it to you or trying to knock your block off or anything like that. And Nick Hughes's book, How to Be Your Own Bodyguard, I think is really, really, really important because what it does is it, it outlines to you the importance of recognizing the shortcomings in your own teaching system. Okay, so the book's there, How to Be Your Own Bodyguard uh, by Nick Hughes. You can get it on Kindle. You can also get the hard copy. You've ordered it. I've got it. I it should arrived. have bought it. I'll bring it next week. Yeah, yeah. bring it next week. Um, I've got the Kindle version, and I think it's fantastic. I know Nick is working very hard on uh, adding to that um, with some more practical uh, um, offerings as well. So anyway, very exciting time for Nick to have his third edition out, and I think – uh, CT session, good question, Marco. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that's that. I've just recently uh, realised that I think 92% of football players in America have um, levels of CTE, um, and I'm sure in rugby league it's is as worse, if not as bad, if not worse, course, yeah. uh, because they don't have the helmet. Of course, when you don't have the helmet, you change your tackling style, and the helmet leads to more trauma, I think, because you think the helmet is going to save you, but yeah. it doesn't. You know, it just it doesn't. But anyway, look, this whole concept based on soil size uh, pattern. Let's look just at that Garyu takedown one more time. It's so beautiful and it's so valuable. In the cutter, you may remember. Come down in this position. Oh. Even further. So in the kata, you may remember that you come down in this position. Bawashi uke. So that's defending and take down. Okay. So from the front, it looks like that. As you get older, the knees aren't as healthy. So for people over a certain age, I'd say 50, you may want to actually come to here to do the kata because it takes the pressure off the knee. Okay, the important thing to remember, if I could just use Mitch's leg, the correct angle is from the inside out. So it's this angle that I'm doing. If Mitch had this leg forward, this will not work because he'll turn and do a 360 and knock you out of the roundhouse kick. Boom, let's see that roundhouse kick. Oh, bang. Exactly. Okay. So it's not going to work pressuring from the outside in. If that situation arises as he turns, you have to dive for the other legs. And the way I did it then is not the right way. We did it today as well. Yeah. We did that today as well. We worked on the whole idea. Is if he swings out of it, I need to take this hand to the knee, not the ankle. If I take it to the ankle, if he does nothing else, he can just sit on me. Boom, sit back, and then spin around, and the next thing you know, I'm in trouble. But if I take the knee, now he sits on me, boom, and he goes nowhere. So the ankle and knee, very interesting concept. Once again, taught to me by Rico Chabrell. Okay? So the correct angle for the Garyu takedown is 45, approximately 45. If it's 43, no one's going to complain. But you get my drift. Coming from the inside, just under the knee, to the outside. This hand traps the foot. It doesn't lift the foot. I don't do this. Okay? I trap the foot on the ground and push across this. I've even used it with quite a degree of success when I'm in a, a grappling situation where I'll come in here and push like that. And I, I use that quite a lot depending on Certain guys will do stand-up passing, and that makes that Garyu takedown very, very available there. So there's that Garyu takedown once. So there's that Garyu takedown once again. So anyway, I think that's really interesting. Work on that two-hand drag. Remember the biomechanics? If I pull, if I pull this hand down really hard and, and hold the pressure, and Mitch pulls up, Keep going, you can ask the stronger man will win. But you notice what he does is he rip, he kind of 
gets a little shudder. But if I pull down with short, sharp motions, it's difficult. Yeah. It's much okay. harder for him. Okay, it's like pulling your jeans on when they're really tight. You're not going to get it. You're just a boop, boop, boop like that. So it's the same principle where you actually want to drag short, sharp, explosive motions. That's a really important um, uh, factor in a lot of the stuff we do. Just one comment on all of this too, because we did it on Monday and Wednesday lunchtime sessions. Um, the amount, it seems so simple, but the amount of drilling required mm. to get it mm. against progressively non-compliant opponents is very necessary. Isn't it true? Yeah, because I, conceptually I can look at this and go, yeah, I get it. And I know I've said this before, but I think it's such an important point because this is the second day that we've done a lot mm. of this. And personally, I'm a slow learner, so don't use me as an example. But even the other people, some people were still working on. So yes. it takes some, some skills to develop this. Yeah, and it's a timing thing. If they plant, if you drag their hand to get the front foot, they take the front foot back and plant their weight, you have to think very quickly because you're in a little bit of trouble there. They could put a lot of pressure on you, sprawl around you, things like that. But if you time it so that you keep strong control of their wrist, pulling down so that just before the foot gets the weight in it, bang, you rip down again. It's like they step back and then fall forward again. It's really a very beautiful technique. There you have it. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. Thanks for coming along. Good to see everyone again. Harry. Good to see you. Uh, Matus, good to see you. Thanks, everyone. Look, that's just a simple approach to takedowns and the correct way to use the Garyu uh, takedown of Solsai. Okay? So I uh, uh, hope you enjoy that. Hope you get something out of it. Uh, if you're in Sydney, the Sol Kyokushin boys in Sydney, I'll be doing a seminar at uh, Anthony Zamadia's dojo on Saturday. I'm um, going down tomorrow training thursday friday with them uh by all means come along mitch always good to see how others in karate apply the same principles i'm familiar yeah good there you go i love that um there's no doubt about it. it's a little bit like uh the question about uh muchimi you know i've never practiced muchimi but i'm fairly certain that the principles of connection and leverage that we use are very definitely in accord with the principles of Muchimi. Just, I would say, perhaps that the training methodology might be a little different. But anyway, good to see your name, Al. Hope everything's going well for you up there. Uh, thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again next week. Us.